Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Hello, and welcome back to the Nano Hub U course Thermal Energy at the Nanoscale. We're now at the end of week four, and uh, this is the lecture in which we kind of wrap up things and hopefully pull some things together. We started the week talking about heat flux, and ultimately we got into expressing the heat flux in terms of uh, a ratio uh, with a temperature difference, and so that turns into a thermal conductance, and, and we'll talk about that in a moment. The general heat flux term is shown here in a summation form over K space, and you can see it's a little bit complicated. Uh, several different terms, the velocity, so if, if we're talking about the flux of something that it's moving and so we'd expect to see a velocity, there's a nuance here that this is the velocity in the direction of transport, so that's the x direction. We multiply that by energy, uh, and in this case we're, we're subtracting the chemical potential if it's non-zero. And then we multiply by this, uh, this transmission function, that's the script T, and then we have the statistics, so that's the distribution function finally, and the C0 there is for um, zero-point energy. And then we normalize the flux by the dimensionality of the problem, so uh, that's the, the prefactor is L to the power D, and so that length dimension, uh, one of those length dimensions cancels with the length dimension and the velocity, and so that gives us in three dimensions a energy flow rate per unit area, for example. We compare this to internal energy and we went through that. It looks very similar and the things that we've added here essentially are the, uh, the group velocity and the transmission function. So if we apply this to two-dimensional systems, this is more of a reminder that we typically don't want to express or evaluate the heat flux in terms of uh, the summations, and so we try to turn them into integrals wherever we can. The, the heat flux that's shown here is the net heat flux, so what we've done is we've uh, subtracted the right to left component from the left to right component to, uh, to achieve this, to, to arrive at this expression, so that's why we have this difference in distribution functions. And then we also have the, uh, the velocity in the direction of interest relative to transport, and so we have a cosine theta. This is for a two-dimensional problem that's shown here, um, and we go ahead and evaluate those integrals, um, and when we do that, it's really like averaging over the cosine theta term, and so I have that in the note on this slide. And then one caveat to all of this is that whenever we go from a summation form or a Cartesian space form of an integral or summation over K space to one of these radial forms of the integrals. Generally what we're having to do both with velocity and with transmission function um, is to assume that those terms depend only on the magnitude of K of the wave vector and not its direction. And that's not a perfectly good assumption most of the time, but it's one that we have to make uh, in order to arrive at analytical results. So then we introduced this concept of the number of modes, and in the lecture we we started by uh, really just deducing it mathematically. Uh, we found that it, it is a dimensionless number, and physically what it represents is the number of subbands that fit into the device. Um, in a two-dimensional problem like I'm showing here, that means that the, the number of half wavelengths that would fit into the width of the device. That's the way to, to rationalize it. So if we, get, if we have a wider two-dimensional material, then we'll be able to fit more of these half wavelengths in, and so we would expect to have more transport. That's, the, that's really what M does. And we, we went through a number of different uh, derivations for different dimensionalities and different carrier types, phonons and electrons. And so in, in frequency space, if we look at just 1D and 2D materials, because those are maybe the more unusual ones relative to what you've seen before, um, the, the number of modes in one dimension 
it, it's a very satisfying result, at least to me, is that if we really have a one-dimensional problem, then we only have one mode in that transverse direction. So the, the number of modes is one by definition in 1D problems. And it's nice to know that you know, even if you don't presume that going in, that the, an, the analysis that we, that we do to arrive at an expression for the number of modes uh, gives us that value of unity. In two dimensions, we find that, uh, that the number of modes is, is not such a simple number, but it depends on the, uh, the dispersion relation. So that's k as a function of, of frequency, so the wave vector as a function of frequency. And then you see that these terms with the group velocity uh, are included. And I want to I, I want to explain why uh, we keep the group velocity separated out a bit. Normally, we would see an expression as shown in the 2D line here, and we'd say, well, let's just cancel out a lot of those numbers, the, the group velocity in particular. And the reason we don't do it is really more educational at this point. The, the bracketed terms in all of these equations, 1D, 2D, and 3D, represent the average velocity in the direction of interest. So you'll notice that in, on the previous slide, the average of cosine theta, the angular average of cosine theta, is 2 divided by pi. And so that's why, this, that's why we're keeping these terms together and saying, well, that, that term in brackets really represents the average group velocity for that frequency. And that's a nice, a nice way of thinking of it. The other terms have to do with the, uh, the dispersion relation. And so in three dimensions, we have a k-squared dependence uh, instead of a, a k to the first power dependence like we have in two dimensions. And so that, that uh, exponent on k becomes important because we're going to we'll, we'll, we'll use that result in a bit to express some of the conductance uh, results. So this is just really a reminder slide when we talk about heat flux um, J. It's heat flux is the heat flow rate divided by the, the cross-sectional area, and we put area in quotes because area really has meaning in, in three dimensions, um, at least in, in the sense of a flux. Uh, it's the true area. That's the bottom equation here. But, if, but our area in quotes in two dimensions is actually a width. And then in a one-dimensional problem, the cross-sectional area for transport is really not defined, and so the heat flux is also the heat flow rate Q. So then we, we moved on to thermal conductance. And so to derive thermal conductance, what we, what we do in essence is to uh, divide the heat flow rate by the temperature difference between a hot and cold reservoir in our uh, canonical problem that we're or we've been working on from the beginning of the course. So we have this device that's bridging two reservoirs and we want to know how much heat is flowing between them and the, a more universal way of studying that problem is to, is to express a, a thermal conductance just like we have for electrical conductance. And when we, when we take this, when we do the analysis, instead of using a T1 minus T2, as, so the two temperatures as being very much uh, different, we'd like to, uh, to have them be small so that we have sort of an incremental amount of heat flow. This then thermal conductance starts to look a little bit more like a property, a temperature dependent property, for example. And so when we have that very small temperature difference, we can approximate the difference in the distribution functions, those are the Fs, as the derivative of the distribution function with respect to temperature multiplied by this small temperature increment, which itself is, which itself forms the denominator of the thermal conductance definition. When we do all of these things and we, we a little bit of, of algebraic manipulation, we find that the thermal conductance can be expressed as the product of really four things um, and then integrated over, over the frequency or energy space. The four things are the number of modes, the energy of the carrier, that's h bar omega for phonons, uh, the transmission function, that's the script T, and then the derivative of the distribution function with respect to temperature. So you have those four terms. Actually, the product of those four terms is what we'll call the spectral conductance. We call it spectral because 
it is it depends on frequency or energy and we can convert that to, to depending on wavelength or wave number as well and so this this uh, overall conductance we find from integrating the spectral conductance in whatever space we're interested in so if we go a step further and normalize the spectral conductance and why would we do that well the answer is that uh, we, we can make it non-dimensional and so much more general than you'll often see in the analysis of, of thermal conductance. So we have this normalized spectral conductance. The fact that it's normalized is, normalized is signified by the tilde on top of the capital G. We normalize it by the number of modes and the transmission function. Uh, the transmission function in particular we haven't talked very much about, so that, that makes a lot of sense. The number of modes is, is a nice thing to normalize by because essentially you're saying that what the normalized spectral conductance is normalized by however mo many modes we have. That's the number of subbands or wavelengths in the cross-section of the material. And then we have this term chi that uh, is important to recognize what it stands for. It's really a normalized energy. So for phonons, that's h bar, h bar omega divided by the thermal energy. And for electrons, it's E minus mu. Mu is, is the chemical potential normalized by thermal energy. And the reason that we have a mu for electrons, we include mu here for electrons, is that when we're, when we're looking at electronic transport, an electron will move and carry heat with it, but it will also be replaced by another electron. And so that replacement process uh, is, is what gives us that, that mu, that subtraction of mu. So if we plot this spectral conductance, this is, this is again, this, the spectral conductance normalized per mode and assuming, you could, you could think of it as assuming that the transmission function is one, it's meaning it's perfect transmission, we get a graph that looks like this, um, and we'll see it again in a moment. Uh, but what it tells us is that this normalized conductance takes a value, value of unity uh, all the way up until the energy is about the same as the thermal energy. That means that in this case h bar omega is the same as or very close to the same as uh, kBT. And then after that it drops off. And so this particular chart is it sh we will use uh, in a moment and we did use uh, during the week to calculate the quantum of thermal conductance. And so it's I think it, it's a nice way of visualizing that. We took, uh, we went a step further and said that for higher dimensions, the, we find that those, uh, that the number of modes is proportional to k to the power d minus 1, where d is the dimensionality. So in, in one dimension, k to the power, k goes to the power 0, so that's just 1. But for two dimensions, it's k to the power 1, and in three dimensions, it's k to the power, power 2. And if we then further take the Debye approximation, which means that the frequency is proportional to k, the wave vector, uh, then we find that you know, it might be useful to have, to, to understand this product that's boxed in the top left here. That's chi, that's the uh, normalized energy of the carrier, raised to the power alpha, where alpha corresponds to the dimensionality minus one. And so what we start to see in this, in this conductance plot is a peaking. Once we get past the zero, the one-dimensional result, that's alpha equals zero, which has no explicit maximum, uh, we see that for alpha equals one and two, those are the ones we're mostly concerned with, um, they have peaks in the spectral conductance, and this, again, this is a weighted spectral conductance, and those peaks correspond to the energies at which the conductance will be maximum. And so that's an important factor if you wanted to, for example, block certain carriers you'd want to want if you had some means of blocking carriers in the structure the physical structure that you make you would want to block the ones that had that were uh, contributing the most to the thermal conductance and this graph is what would tell you generally how to do that or at least what what energy and frequency range you'd need to need to look at So then we went from there to going back a, a little bit of a step to the um, to the quantum of thermal conductance. So we're going to go back to the simplest form where we have perfect transmission, 
and we have a one-dimensional conductor, that means that M equals one, and we now, using that, those assumptions, we, uh, we define this G hat, which is the integrated form of G tilde, which is the, the normalized spectral conductance. We find that this integral is, uh, can be evaluated. Again, we're essentially integrating under the curve that's shown here that we had a couple of slides ago. And when we do that, we find the quantum of thermal conductance. And it's a number, I mean, it's a, it's a number times a temperature. In this case, the, the, the factor, the, the fact that it includes temperature, it's the, the quantum of thermal conductance is directly proportional to temperature. Um, sometimes gives learners a, a little bit of confusion because they're used to seeing the, uh, the quantum of electrical conductance and it does not, it's just a number, it's just a, a grouping of constants. And they wonder why, why do we have temperature here? Uh, why is this linearly proportional to temperature? The answer is that we've taken an energy moment to calculate thermal conductance, whereas for electrical conductance, uh, there's no energy moment in the in the integration process. Um, it's just you, we're just counting charge for electrical conductance, and to do that, we don't have to take that extra energy moment. And so that should help to I think uh, help you understand why this has why the quantum of thermal conductance has a temperature dependence to it. And as you might expect, we get more conductance at higher temperatures because the there, there are more carriers. Uh, thermal energy carriers at higher temperatures, and so that's that's another you know closely uh, uh, closely affiliated way of saying uh, the same thing. So for electrons, we actually find the same result uh, within a factor of two. That's the the spin degeneracy part, uh, but the result, the the numerical result, is otherwise the same, and that's a little bit surprising too, perhaps. But it turn, because the the statistics for phonons and electrons are different. And so, again, people wonder, you know, what happened? That we had you know, substantially different occupation statistics, and yet we have the same result here. It, it's sort of a, a nuance of the mathematics that um, that these functions, at least in, in some of the approximations that we have to make to evaluate the integrals, essentially um, essentially look the same. So, with that. I will finish the talk and I will see you next week. Thanks.